You're the last one? Yeah, best slot ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, great crowd. Okay. So, um, uh, we're finishing with uh, an academic presentation. Sort of? <laughs> no, more uh, technical, I guess. Oh, yeah, in, technical. Between, in between, in between. You're, you're from academia? Yeah, from academia, yeah. But yeah. I'm also doing a lot of reverse engineering, so. Um, and um, all this conference has been to bring, bringing together people from the private sector, from academia, from law enforcement, and so on. So I'm, I'm happy that we finish with you. Okay. Thomas, <laughs> okay. you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Thomas Barbos, and um, I'm from Fauno for FKIE. And I think, uh, would like to thank everybody that's still here, even though it's the last slot. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, behavior-driven development in malware analysis. Might sound strange at first, so therefore that's actually the uh, word cloud of the little paper I wrote for this presentation. And there are three words that, um, that actually should strike your eye. That's test, code, and malware. And you might be asking, well, there's one outlier, right? Maybe code and malware that works by testing. So, and um, that's my, what my talk is going to um, be about. So, um, how we could improve basically some parts of the malware analysis process by using basically something like test driven or behavior driven development. So, as a quick motivation, um, um, as you all know, really uh, malware analysis continues to be um, tedious and very time consuming. And um, some people might call it uh, job security. Um, you have to, you, if you really want to do profound analysis, you have to get your hands on it. And um, one of those tasks you're actually doing um, on a daily basis or, um, is the extraction of certain behavior from a malicious binary, let's say the network protocol or a DGA. And um, what you usually would do is you analyze the um, properly obfuscated binary code and then you basically re-implement it in a higher, um, higher language like C and Python in order to be able to execute this behavior. What happens is um, many people, what many people do, and I count myself in because I do it sometimes as well, is that you, you basically uh, are a poor uh, decompiler. You're basically um, just translating the code from assembly to Python and the EIXs and EBXs are still floating around in the Python code. Um, so, and also you don't um, actually ensure the functionality, so you, you don't know if it's really working for, for a lot of cases or just the strange corner case um, you picked and um, yeah, the, the readability might be very poor. Um, you don't have actually documentation of this code, how, how you can interact with this. So um, maybe other uh, people you give it a hand it out have to <laughs> reverse this code as well. And yeah, the underlying semantics are sometimes not clear because you, you don't think about it, you're just decompiling it. So I propose maybe a solution to maybe improve this process here a little bit. So let's see um, how this might work. Before, um, I would like to talk about related work. Basically what we wanted to have um, would be something that we could automatically extract this uh, malicious behavior. Uh, in theory, this, is, this actually works according to the academic papers that, that have been written. So we just um, pinpoint to behavior and extract it and have our, um, our self-contained binary. But in practice, there are so many, so many open problems that have to be tackled that this stuff does not work in practice. Um, and also, in many cases, it's, it's not publicly available. So. Um, then um, what people also tried, and they um, kind of what I'm, right, I'm, I'm going to do is that um, they, they applied um, test driven development to reverse engineering in order to improve it somehow. But um, they, uh, uh, pre, uh, they, they demanded that the source code and documentation is there, which is not always the case in, in case of malware. So um, then I thought about um, what, what I wanted to have from a, of a proper solution in order to improve it. So um, what I want to have is, is that it's the analyst allows first to describe concisely and naturally what he's observing in the binary and what's the behavior and all its sub-modules actually doing in natural language. So by describing it, you're improving your understanding of it. Then um, Turing implementing it 
um, I want it to work continuously. So I want to have my tests that say, well, this submodule works and keeps on working while I'm working on another submodule, maybe. And um, then um, the, the resulting code should be, um, should be concise, documented, and readable. Um, and finally, um, I would like to increase maybe the focus um, of an analyst by doing it. So my solution would be just to try something like a test, uh, like a start-driven development process, in this case, behavior-driven development, and apply it to my analysis. So um, before I'm going to talk about um, how I'm going to do it, um, I'm just giving a quick recap about um, start-driven development. And um, first, there was basically software testing and what it, what's in software testing, we're doing it s since a couple of decades. Um, what it actually does, it test, tests whether software um, does what it's supposed to do. And um, sounds trivial, but in, in the end, um, this shows also quality to the stakeholders. They maybe um, pay you for the software you're programming and yeah. And the problem here is if you're doing it infrequently, for example, if people did in a waterfall model, then you, you write a concept, you write the software, a couple of weeks you're doing the testing by another team. Uh, this does not work that good. Um, also, if you first write the code and then trying to test it, you, you won't have a very high code coverage of the tests. And yeah, if you, do, if you don't automatic, uh, doing it automatically, yeah, it's not that efficient. So people um, at the beginning of the millennium basically came up with test-driven development. And the idea here is that you write the test first, and then you implement um, actually what you're, uh, what, uh, what you're testing. So in test-driven development, we've got this, um, this small circle here. And um, it uh, contains uh, three, uh, three different steps. At first, you write actually the test um, what, um, of what you, uh, what you want to implement. And then, um, then you, you, you see the test fail. Um, you execute it, of course, automatically. And then you implement as much code as you, as you need in order to make this test pass. So this um, ensures that, for example, you've got a one, ideally, you, that you got 100% on um, test coverage. Um, in, in the last step, you're actually refactoring it. And refactoring it's always a touchy subject because people, uh, if, you, if you don't have tests and you have to refactor like, something on the other end of the software, you might break it on the, on the other end side. So uh, if you got tests and uh, you get directly noticed that y if you break something, well, then, um, then you're very confident to do it. Furthermore, those tests actually serve as a low level, um, as a low level uh, documentation of your code. Because, uh, because they show how to interact with the, with the modules that you're writing. So programmers can read those tests and know how to use this code. So then people came up actually with behavior-driven development, which um, in contrary to TDD, um, focuses more on a clear understanding of the software behavior instead of, let's say, on a function level and very low level. So um, they, they are a little bit uh, high level, basically. And BDD emerged from TDD. And um, half a year ago, I, uh, I read on their website, they're still discussing what's actually BDD. So there's nothing like in Scrum. They say, if you don't do this, you don't do Scrum. They're more like, they're not that much strict. They say, yeah, if you do this, this could be also BDD. The, the good thing, the important thing here to notice is that, well, the test cases uh, you, you're basically writing are in natural language. So, and, um, um, this allows you to, to first um, express your thoughts, like you, you, you're actually thinking. And even though you're expressing th those stuff in natural language, um, you've got a strong th theoretic foundation. Namely, using, um, you're using basically the whole logic, which is used in order to prove um, the partial correctness of computer programs. Um, here on the um, bottom, part of this, uh, bottom part of the slide, you can see the so-called hot triple, which is basically um, PQ, CQ, and it's a stand. There's a set of P's, uh, which is which are preconditions, and C is a command. And if this command is executed with this set of preconditions, then um, Q has to hold. Well, basically, um, this is then expressed in natural language, like given when then. So a typical BDD test looks like this. Let's say you've got you've got a, a coffee maker, and you're implementing the scenario that you that you um, adding the sugar to the coffee. 
Um, so you given that the customer has pressed a, a, the sugar button, uh, when the customer presses the cold button in order to make this or to brew this coffee, then actually um, the coffee should have uh, sugar within it. So now um, I'm showing you how to how we could apply apply actually this to to MEV analysis. Um, so um, that's the overview how you how you would do it, how you could do it. Um, so it's there are two actually two two phases. So we've got a preparation phase. Um, where you basically get your, your, your machines ready, your virtual machines ready, but also you, um, you, you're, you're writing an initial end-to-end -end acceptance test of the behavior that you're, uh, that you're re implementing. And uh, once this acceptance test um, passes, um, as you see later, um, then you know that you've 100% implemented this behavior. And um, once you've um, finished this, preparation phase, you're going into the implementation phase, which is kind of uh, inspired by this TDD cycle. It's, um, it's the first, you've got an observe um, uh, step where you're basically looking at the binary and trying to understand what, are, what is happening. Then you're writing a test for the part that you're re-implementing. Then, you, um, then you're actually implementing what are you going to re-implement it. And then you're going to refactor it in order to make it nice and concisely. Um, now I'm going into, into detail of all the phases. First, I'm starting with the preparation phase. Fir very important thing here is um, you have to pinpoint basically the behavior at first in the binary. Otherwise, you won't be able to reverse it. So that's the first step. And um, what you're doing is that you, you're basically trying to find an entry point of this behavior. Just let's assume it's a DJA because we all uh, by now we all uh, love DJAs. So where let's say something is passed in that's um, that's the S, the entry point. And then um, at some point, the behavior or the algorithm that is um, associated with the behavior ends. And that's uh, um, one or multiple exit points because there might be error conditions and so on and so forth. Um, at those um, basically borders of, um, of the behavior, you would um, extract initial test data. So you, you, you're actually acquiring a set of input and output data and using this for an acceptance test. And um, this acceptance test basically ga guides you uh, through, um, through the, through the re-implementation process. Um, because in, at first, if you first execute it, you don't have any code, it will fail. But then um, if you, uh, if you, if you re the behavior 100%, then this um, acceptance test will or should definitely um, pass. So um, as an example, again here, a DGA, how could one uh, pinpoint a DGA? Um, I don't have to say that much about DGAs. We saw, saw a lot of them. So basically, there, there, there's a classification, um, how you could classify them. So they're either deterministic or non-deterministic, or they're time-dependent or time-independent. And um, most of them are time-dependent. So um, what, 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 what one could do is here, basically, doing a na naive approach. A naive approach doing a forward analysis and just looking at the time sources. And um, the idea here is, well, uh, if, they, if the DJA is really um, time dependent, then just break on all the time sources and follow the data uh, to maybe the beginning of the behavior. This would be the forward approach. Backwards, well, if it's really a DJA, at some point this, uh, uh, those domain names that are generated gets, get uh, re resolved by DNS and, well, then uh, you could, for example, breakpoint on such um, APIs like get host by name and follow it backwards to the code to the end of the, of the behavior. Um, in the paper, I ex explain another case, but yeah. Um, well, then that's, uh, we're coming now to the real impl re implementation phase. And that's the first step, which is basically observing the behavior. And what we are doing is we are basically using a top down approach and first, want to get, get a rough overview of the behavior of the algorithm and then dive deeper into the um, sub-algorithms, sub-modules, and um, identify these uh, individual um, features, as I call it here, and their interfaces. Very important is also that we um, first implement it on a high level, um, so, and then um, gather at those um, interfaces that we've, um, that we've 
basically um, um, identified this test, da uh, test data for other tests. Uh, um, and for excuse me for for using it and um, for mocking it first. So um, this is what um, what what I'm going here to talk about it. Then when we know what we are going, what part of the behavior we're going to implement, um, we're stating basically this this uh, test in a given then when um, form and um, implement um, testing it uh, from a high level. And basically, um, one fundamental idea here is that we lose, use a lot of mock objects and behavior that um, features that are very down into the behavior shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be looked at at first. This helps also to um, to focus on on one part at a time. So therefore, we we just gather at the interfaces of those submodules um, test data and use mock objects. And those mock objects are typically uh, used uh, to mimic real objects. In software development, there, for example, to replace mock um, objects that you cannot ex um, that you cannot access due to timing constraints, like databases, maybe or uh, non-existing objects. And here, in our case, basically, we use those mock objects to represent parts of the code uh, that we haven't understood 100%. Um, yeah. Then, in the in the third step. Oh, excuse me. That's an um, example, actually, how we um, how we would do it. So that's the behavior, uh, which um, has a has a main. Uh, that's the main behavior, and it consists of uh, three submodules, basically, um, initialization, another submodule called a main, and a deinitialization. And then um, this a main also has two submodules, a one and a two. And what we are doing when we re-implementing a main is. Basically, we, we mocking a1 and a2, and don't don't deal with with this at first. So we we going from the top to the bottom. So in the third um, step, basically, we 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 trying to make this um, this this test for the submodule um, to pass, and write just enough code to do this. And again, we have to uh, we have to look at the binary. Uh, this is the <laughs> This is the valid uh, system specification that we um, that we that we have to um, re-implement, and here we, we shouldn't care about uh, optimization because at this stage we should just get it first right and make the test pass, and then we can optimize it later. Um, namely, in the th in the fourth step where we refactoring our code in order to make it more concisely and more readable. Um, refactoring basically is. Uh, it's altering of the syntax of the code without altering the semantics. So um, there are so many refactorings out there. There's a very interesting book written by Fowler a couple of years ago where you can find a lot. In the case of uh, reverse engineering, um, we might, for example, um, refactoring inline code that we've actually re-implemented, let's say a mem copy or something like that. Uh, we could break up complex expression or remove dead expressions, actually. At this point in time, we um, we have a look at this initial end-to-end -end acceptance test that we wrote, and look if this if it's passing, well then this means that we've re-implemented um, the behavior uh, from the from the beginning to the end basically. Um, if it does not pass, we have to go through this um, cycle one more time or several times. So let's talk a little bit about limitations and critics. So one limitation might be decrease in time efficiency. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that might be true. For example, if you think about um, TDD, um, people estimated um, that there might be a time, um, time uh, uh, decrease in time efficiency of between 15 to 35 uh, percent. But um, I think um, if, you, if you're doing it this way, um, the extra time may pay off to do several benefits, like for example, you're focusing on one part at a time, and the thing is that you, for example, having the code working constant, constantly throughout the re-implementation process um, is, is, of, is very, very nice to have. So for example, if you don't do it and you introduce a bug into your code, you could debug it maybe for, for half an hour, and this makes you also slower. Um, yeah, maybe this is more like a critic that uh, well, TDD, BDD, it's usually for normal software development. Why we shouldn't um, uh, do it, apply it to maybe analysis? 
people say it's a throwaway code, it's a reusability, might be not needed. And um, I would say that's, that's not true. And um, we've got long running projects that base on code of reverse engineers. And therefore, it's, um, for us, it's important to have this, um, this code. So um, in order to, to get you to show you how you could do this in practice, um, I want to do a case study on my MAME. It's a MAME dropper. And yeah, unfortunately, I picked um, the DGA of my MAME. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, um, Nymam, um, it's a malware dropper, help, uh, mainly, but also the, it's, a, can be, it's using parts, I think, of the pony loader code in order to uh, steal credentials. It's, uh, it has SOX proxies. Um, what's very interesting um, about the family is that it's very heavily obfuscated, so you will see that in a minute. And... Um, I think, especially in those cases, um, what what I what I'm proposing here helps you a lot in order to uh, to get more if, get this stuff m done more efficiently. Um, there's a little bit work on um, decompiling of an older uh, sorry, not decompiling of deobfuscating um, this code of Nyman by Daniel Plomon um, called Ida Patchwork. It's an um, Ida um, Ida Pro plugin. Um, but those guys are keep on um, obfuscating and then obfuscation. So um, yeah, it's it's unfortunately uh, those are very good. So here you can see a uh, sample unpacked trial example I've analyzed this summer, and what you can see if you can see it is that um, it's unpacked. The functions look quite. Uh, quite regular. There are no st strange constants. Actually, those constants that are um, that are that are there are annotated by Ida Pro, so that's uh, that's quite useful. Um, the, the imports are resolved. They, they seem also reasonable. So you first set some uh, socket options, and then you're doing some error op operation on on the network API. So this seems reasonable. The control flow also seems reasonable. So if you got experience in reverse engineering, you could read this more or less like a book. In contrary, if you look at an unpacked MyMail sample, um, you, you, you see that uh, um, that's, it's, it's full of irregular functions. There is no clear function and, cl uh, no clear function entries. Um, also, there are strange constants, and actually those strange constants are, for example, used in order to um, dynamically uh, computer control flow. Um, furthermore, uh, this also confuses the disassembler, so Ida Pro gives you very poor results. And it's um, basically very, very hard to, uh, to, to um, statically analyze it statically, but also it's very hard to analyze it um, dynamically. Um, because uh, because all those control flow changes and uh, those dynamic control flow computations also mess a little bit with your breakpoints, and that's not that much fun. Um, what I used for tools for basically re-implementing the GA is that uh, I used uh, standard tools, Immunity Debugger, Ida Pro, <coughs> uh, used uh, Mendiant APA, APA DNS in order to um, fake uh, DNS responses. Uh, we implemented the behavior in Python and used as a BDD library behave. Um, later on, I'm going to um, push the source code to, to Bitbucket so you can, uh, can have a look. And I think that's always better than talking about source code in slides. So um, you should definitely have a look and um, see how, it, um, how one could do this. So um, what I did is, was that I first, basically, I did some first observations. Um, I did some basic black boxing. And what I saw, um, the domains that were resolved were basically hard, looked like hard-coded domains. First, there was a connectivity sh check to Google, and then some, something else, which looked rather hard-coded. <coughs> then when, uh, when, when those domains failed, um, when, it, when it couldn't contact those domains, Basically, it started to generate um, random domains, as you can see there. And I checked it basically quickly in two different VMs, saw that the results are the same. And basically, then it's deterministic, um, I supposed. And basically, then I ch changed the time 
um, and saw, yeah, that's uh, time dependent um, because on different dates the, the domains are different. So what I did basically, yeah, I thought we could uh, break on get system time and bingo, it worked. So I knew that um, this was um, very imp was important API for the, for the DJ. And we had actually the import, uh, with what, which was the time, more specifically um, a certain struct that is returned by get system time, um, which was then later used as a seed. And it outputted um, basically 30 domain names. So then, basically, still in the, uh, in the preparation phase, um, we, uh, we already knew very important parameters. So we knew the, 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 the start and the exit point of this algorithm, so the interfaces. So then we basically let the binary run. I breaked at the beginning, I breaked at the end, let it run, and gathered basically the data at both ends and wrote an initial, um, initial acceptance test, which guided me through the implementation and showed me when I've basically finished um, the behavior re implementation. So um, this was basically the, the first scenario I wrote, the first, um, uh, uh, this initial acceptance test. Um, and this is uh, describing the whole behavior. So the scenario was that NIMAMDJ computes uh, domains on a, cert a specific date. Given the state, blah, 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 that when uh, the, G the DJA computes uh, the domains for these dates, then the domains should be blah, 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 and there will be 30 domains. What happens is if you execute it without having written code, it fails, and yeah, well, I had to um, had to re-implement it. So um, what I uh, then I, I first I entered the cycle first. I was in this um, observing phase, and I stepped through the code and noticed that there are several uh, several algorithms involved. Like there was an initialization where the seeds uh, at the time was used um, and this, um, was. Um, there was some computation with the time and some hard-coded seeds. And then it entered in a main logic. And in this main logic, um, the domains were generated. And this main logic um, co communicated with another module, which was a pseudo-random number generator, uh, which later then turned out uh, to be source shift. And what, what I did, basically, I uh, focused on one component at a time, and um, first reversed the main logic and mocked the rest. So that's only part of the main logic. Um, what, I di what I did is try to follow through it. I did it in the debugger. I, th I found it to be easier than doing it statically due to the heavy obfuscations, and basically came up with, um, came up with this code. And then, um, I um, start uh, parts of this is only the main the main module and all the stuff that is uh, that, that that is called from there it's uh, still not implemented. So then I thought, well, it's now time to focus on another part, going one step deeper and looking at how to basically compute the TLD, TLD of a domain. So basically, um, we I mocked everything, the rest, and um, then uh, I came up with the scenario for, uh, for, for implement, re-implementing this part that actually computes the TLDs. So I've given the scenario that the NIMMDJ chooses the correct TLD from a set that I, uh, that I saw there, and um, given some seeds, when the TLD should be computed, then basically this, the TLD should be RU. Um, and then I um, consulted the binary, uh, we looked how it is done, we implemented it, did the refactoring, moved on to the next part. Then uh, I already talked about this, um, the seeds and the pseudo-random number generator, which was another module I first just mocked. So I had seeds that going in, seeds that coming out, and furthermore, uh, some no random number that was, uh, that was generated by it that I used for my mocks. Now it was time to, to really dive into this um, pseudo-random number generator. At this moment, I didn't know anything about XOR shift. Uh, so I basically, I reversed it. And um, as you can see here, for this uh, has, takes five integers. Four of them are 
seeds and one model modulo, and outputs an integer in the range of the uh, from zero to modulo minus one. So um, one has to be ca careful here because the seeds, uh, the, uh, this um, the execution of this pseudo random number generator had basically side effects on the seeds. So then I came again first um, with a test, what I wanted to test, and I dived into the in the binary, we implemented it, we factored it, we moved all the EAX and gave it actually, um, I think by this um, my colleague Daniel um, could quite easily um, see that it's Xorshif when he prepared his slide for his presentation because actually uh, they use in a Wikipedia entry, they use also ABC, so uh, there was, it resembled then quite nicely what um, uh, what the original re -implementa implementation looks like. So the results basically were um, that, that this whole feature at the end passed after a couple of tests um, that I wrote for further uh, submodules and um, that the code basically was readable, it was split in several classes and yeah, um, that's the outcome. Basically, confusion and future work now. It's, um, today I showed you how you could be, uh, Im improve the MAV analysis when you analysis process when you re-implement um, behaviors. Um, I told you why you want considering this approach. And I showed you a case study on IMAME and the source code and all the tests and slides and the paper will be also on Bitbucket, so you can check it later out. Um, future work would be to, um, to automate a lot of this stuff, um, what I'm done here manually, for example, tools for just uh, gathering the test data at the interfaces, just giving it to, um, maybe writing a tool and giving it uh, two points in the code and then executing it and gathering the, the input and outputs and um, using it also for automatic test case generation maybe in order to further improve this. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm open to questions. Questions? Yeah. Very good conference, uh, academic uh, presentation. Uh, uh. You, uh, because uh, you want to use uh, test techniques from software engineering to malware analysis. It's a very good idea, uh, but uh, you can't, uh, uh, you are only on a specific case because we, you, you can uh, apply whole logic only to one single model, deterministic and sequential. It, yeah. it, it is not the case. You can't apply these techniques to multi-model, asynchronous, parallel. Okay. Yeah, so. In the next step, you, you must use uh, formal methods that, uh, that have uh, semantic of non-deterministic behavior, uh, asynchronous, uh, and with more uh, complicated uh, theories. Uh, sounds good. definitely interesting. Um, I guess there is no framework for this yet. So in, like, I mean, BDD is relying on it, but, but yeah, we, we can talk about this later. Sounds very interesting, thanks. Another question? Really? The last question of the day? Could okay, be. thank you. Okay. Thank you.